Okay, everyone. So welcome to this special episode of Reiki Radio. We have Sensei Alex with us today. And Sensei Alex is the author of Perfectly Ordinary Buddhist Teachings for Everyday Life. So welcome to Reiki Radio, Sensei Alex. Thank you for having me. I am really looking forward to this conversation. Um, one, it's so timely for all that's going on in the world, but mm -hmm. also having the opportunity to speak to you behind the scenes. I mean, you just, you're just lovely. <laughs> and I'm sure people are <laughs> going to enjoy this conversation. So to begin, um, could you share a little bit about your background? So I do want everyone to know that you are a Buddhist teacher. Mm -hmm. And before we dive into your work, can you just share, you know, our, your story about how you came into Buddhism in the first place? Sure, sure, absolutely. So essentially, I grew up in the evangelical Christian church. Uh, so very strict religious background. You know, we weren't allowed to read the Harry Potter books. We couldn't play the pinball machine at the arcade because that was gambling, that oh. sort of thing. And as a result of that upbringing, I, from a very early age, associated my self-worth with uh, goodness, so being good at things. And that actually worked out very well for me from a material sense, because I had to be the best at everything I did. Yeah. So I got very good grades. I won lots of trophies as a child. Uh, I enlisted in the Marine Corps, deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan. I went to college finished that, got a job, worked my way up the corporate ladder. And I kept waiting for this feeling of happiness, for this feeling of self-worth, of this feeling of wholeness to come uh, based on my accomplishments, always thinking I was one promotion or one move or one purchase away from getting it. And it just wasn't happening, mm -hmm. right? Um, I remember uh, one year in particular where I did really well at work and I got, you know, a, a pretty nice bonus check from my job. And, you know, they had the big ceremony and they hand you the check and whatnot. And I, I w drove home and I was sitting on my couch. I'm staring at this check and all of this money. And I'm just like, just waiting for this feeling to come, like this feeling of, okay, I'm done. And, and it just never happened. Um, so really out of desperation, at that point, I made the decision to switch my focus and start looking in the direction of spirituality. And the thing that attracted me to Buddhism was the first noble truth, which states life is suffering. And, and I talk more about this in the book. Of course, that doesn't mean that life is always unpleasant. It just means we have hardship and we have to be willing to face that and endure it and work through it. But that was just so refreshing for me to hear someone say that. Yeah. Because I was at a point in my life where everyone was telling me I should be happy, I should be okay, and I wasn't. Right. And to read this text that said, you don't feel okay, and it's not your fault, but here are some techniques that can help you feel okay. It was just, it was a breath of fresh air. You know, so there is something very specific I want to ask you about that, about life mm -hmm. is suffering and something that you share in the book. There are so many things about this book I can't wait to dive into, but I want to back up just for one second and talk about how you became a Marine, because you share that story in the uh -huh. book as well from the experience of when you were, what, 11 years old? Yes. And it was just so touching, you know, and I think it really highlighted how, you know, we may not even recognize these small acts of kindness and the impact they can have on other people. So could you share with everyone just that story really quickly of how that impacted <laughs> you? Yeah. Sure, sure, absolutely. So I was in the Boy Scouts as a kid. Um, and for this particular essay, uh, what I describe is in the Boy Scouts, there's a charity called Toys for Tots. And the idea is you you get new toys, so they're not used, they're new toys still in the packaging, and we collect them from different stores, different shops, different people, and then we give them to the United States Marines, and then they get, disseminate them to children who their parents, for whatever reason, can't buy toys for them. So really just ensuring that every child gets to have a Christmas, 
right? So part of that is we always had a ceremony where we did all the toys together and we'd count how many toys we got and one of the Marines would come to pick up the toy and just, you know, hang out with us. And it was really cool. He'd be all dressed up in his dress blues and whatnot. And I didn't really know anything about the military at that point in my life, other than, you know, what I'd seen in GI Joe, but I knew it was very important that you be able to stand at attention and not move. So I did that. So 11 year old Alex, I'm in my scout uniform. I've got my, my marriage merit badges all sewn on and I'm just sitting there and I'm not moving. I'm not talking to anyone, just staring straight ahead. And he comes to talk to me and I don't talk to him because I, I knew you're not supposed to talk at the position of attention, right? So I, I honestly, in my head, I thought he was testing me. <laughs> <laughs> so he's trying to talk to me. I'm not saying anything. And thankfully, one of the other parents kind of figured out what was going on. And they kind of, you know, this is Alex. And, you know, he's interested in the military. And he's at the position of attention, blah, blah, blah. And then uh, the Marine Sergeant's like, oh, okay. So he's like, okay, at ease. So I went to Eddie's, you know, feet shoulder width apart, hands in the small of my back, and now I'm allowed to talk. So we had a really good conversation. I told him, I asked him a few questions. He talked to me about my merit badges, and then he, he leans in and very quietly, so only I could hear him, he says, are there any Marines in your family? And I said, no. And then he goes, well, I think you have what it takes to be the first one. And he, and then at that point, you know, he turns and he walk, talks to one of the other kids and it just blew my mind, right? That, you know, this, this adult in his dress uniform that everyone respects so much thinks like I could be like him, really. And in the book, I include that in the chapter on suffering because, you know, that was actually a really difficult time in my life. You know, I was just starting puberty, so I was going through all of that rigmarole. Um, things weren't exactly the, the best at home uh, between my parents. So there was a lot of suffering in my life, and he knew nothing about any of that. You know, right. he just saw some weird kid, and he wanted to be nice. But that act of kindness had such a huge impact on me then that when I turned 19, I actually chose to become a U.S. Marine myself as yeah. a result. So I just use that to really just show that even though we, there is so much suffering in life, just one very simple act of kindness, just something as simple as a conversation with a child where, you know, you recognize them and you see them and you treat them like, like a grown up can have such a huge effect on the world. Yeah. And I think, and that's why, you know, it really struck me. I had tears in my eyes when I was reading it. I was like, oh my God, this is the <laughs> best story because of exactly what you said. And I think, you know, as adults, because of what we go through, I think a lot of times we don't take into account how impactful our actions are. And yeah. I think a lot of times we think we have to do these big, you know, displays of something and mm -hmm. not realizing um, like just the power and the subtleties, you know? So yes. going back to what you were saying about now, so you are in this space of suffering the small act of kindness really changed the trajectory of your life. And mm -hmm. then you go on to accomplish all the goals, all the things, but right. you're still in your suffering. So I want to ask you, because a lot of us experience this, right? Right. But reading that, okay, life is suffering. And instead of that depressing you, <laughs> that actually <laughs> inspired you. So could right. you just talk a little bit about like, why that inspired you and then what steps you took to, you know, really kickstart your path. Sure, sure. Well, I, I always kind of joke with people and maybe this isn't the best joke, but I'll tell it anyway that, you know, no one starts practicing Buddhism because they're happy. Right. <laughs> um, when you read the first noble truth of Buddhism, when someone tells you life is suffering, that's either appalling to you and you just like, no, get away from me or yes, this makes sense. Life is suffering. You get it, right? And that was my, my reaction, like I said, is like someone understands, right? Mm -hmm. You know, I have this apartment with the granite countertops and the vaulted ceilings. And I've got the sports car and everyone's like, your life is so good. You know, stop being ungrateful. I was like, I'm not saying I don't like my car. It's just 
my car isn't giving me what I'm looking for. Right. <laughs> and I always, um, Buddha, he warns us about this uh, in the suttas about sensual pleasures and how they are enjoyable. You know, there's a reason we like cars and money and things like that. But I always, I always compare it to cotton candy, yeah. right? Uh, when I was a kid, I used to eat lots of cotton candy every time we went to the amusement park. And it would taste really good in the moment, and then I'd get sick, and then it didn't taste good anymore. A couple times I even threw up in the car. So I had to learn that, okay, just because this tastes good doesn't mean it's good for me, right. right? And it doesn't mean I should you know, eat as much of it as I can. And what I realized through my Buddhist practice is that, yeah, cars, jobs, money, you know, these things are fine. There's nothing wrong with them. We can have these things as lay people, but they're not going to fill us the way spiritual practice will fill us. You know, there's a, there's a joy that we can't get from driving our car down the highway or from getting a bonus check, right? Yeah. There's not a lasting, sustaining happiness. So what I get from Buddhism is I get something that's solid, that's lasting, mm -hmm. that's not... Um, that's not dependent on what, what's happening in, in the outside world. It's something reliable. Yeah. And when I saw that, and when I started practicing and really going deep into samadhi, deep into level, different levels of concentration, it, it almost becomes this really healthy cycle where people tell you, okay, you're already enlightened, the truth is inside of you, and you're like, oh, okay, but I've got nothing else to do, so I'll try it, right? And then you, you just, you have this faith in yourself and the practice. So then you try it mm -hmm. and then you, you, you experience something. It's like, okay, maybe there's something here. So then you try it again and then you experience something and it becomes this very healthy cycle, this very healthy circle where the practice builds on itself. You know, it's really interesting you say that. And again, so glad we're having this conversation because I think um, a lot of people are curious about Buddhism and I think for a lot of people, they think like, oh, maybe it's a religion. And if I'm working on my spirituality, I don't necessarily want to go back into some type of religion. Sure. And um, from what I've read of your book so far, and even just what you're saying now, it sounds like in a lot of ways, it's more of a lifestyle. And I have to say, in, in some regard, and I have to say that, um, you know, I too was very curious about Buddhism at some point. I took some classes I shared with you and it was a lot of just meditation and these things, but there wasn't a lot of um, uh, teachings to help me understand sure. really what Buddhism was beyond just the practice of sitting, right? Although right. not to knock sitting, I mean, you learn a lot <laughs> in, <laughs> in this, but your book, I have to say, I can't believe how you simplify these teachings and the examples that you give. I mean, they're just so relatable and it's like, oh my gosh, this makes all the sense in the world. Sure. So I want to ask, um, as you started to study Buddhism and, you know, exploring for yourself, how did you start to come to understand it? Like, what did that look like? Was it because of your practice? Was it because of what you read? Sure. Well, so my practice was very interesting because like I said, I was doing, I spent a lot of time in meditation. I was studying sutras, you know, chanting, things like that. Um, so it was very good, but then I kind of ran into a, a new problem, which was that I couldn't, I, I wasn't sure that I could both practice Buddhism and have an ordinary life at the same time. So I would go on these, you know, three-day meditation retreats, uh, which were very challenging. You know, you're sitting, you can't sit in chairs, you eat what they give you, there's a strict schedule to follow. But you, you come out of it and you feel so clean and your mind is just so, all the garbage is gone, right? right. And that lasts about half a day. And then I go to work. <laughs> right. And now people are yelling at each other on the conference call and you know, I have this coworker who's trying to, you know, get this promotion over me and things like that. So it was a very weird dichotomy where I, um, I really didn't feel like I could do both. Mm -hmm. And what ended up happening was I went on a, a retreat for eight months. I lived and worked on, ah, sorry, I lived and worked on organic farms. 
And during that time, I also spent a great amount of time in meditation doing Buddhist practice. So my, my schedule essentially was I'd wake up, I'd meditate for two hours. Uh, I'd go, I'd do whatever I was doing on that farm in particular, whether that was building a tiny house or working in an orchard. And then, you know, go through my day, eat dinner, meditate for another two to four hours, study sutras, go to sleep. And this, and this was my life for about eight months. And what I found was that I was going very deep into my practice, which was wonderful. I was realizing and understanding it on a, on a much deeper level. But at the same time, I realized that I hadn't escaped my suffering. Mm. I, it had just changed, right? Um, so going back to life is suffering. So there's suffering in the boardroom where people are screaming at you and you're fighting for promotions and pay raises. And there's also suffering on a farm where it's 95 degrees and you're being bitten by horse flies and, you know, it's supposed to be my day off, but we have to get this hay in before it rains. So suck it up, buttercup, let's go. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> so realizing that even with my Buddhist practice, I could not escape the suffering of life. It, it changed in my head from being a way to escape suffering for, to a way to learn from it mm. and a way to use that to strengthen my practice and grow from it. And that's really where the book came from, Perfectly Ordinary Buddhist Teachings for Everyday Life, was just me explaining my own process and how I take these core Buddhist teachings and, okay, okay so how does this help me in a traffic jam? How does this help me when I'm working on a waste oil furnace and I'm dirty and I'm hungry and my hands are cramping up? Uh, how does this help me when I'm late for a meeting and I can't get there, but I can see the building? <laughs> yes. This sort of thing. And what's interesting about Buddhist training, so uh, Eastern traditions are a little bit different than Western traditions. And this kind of gets misunderstood in that so in the West, everything is very head focused. We think about things, we believe it, we intellectualize it, and then we act on it. But in Eastern traditions and in Buddhism, it's actually the opposite. So for example, if I want you to learn humility, I don't say, I don't explain to you why all the reasons that humility is good. Instead, I have you stand in front of the altar and you do 108 vows every day because bowing is an act of humility. And by acting out humility, you learn humility. Right. So it can be difficult for Westerners to kind of wrap their head around it. It's like, cause you go into the temple and it's like, well, what are we doing? Well, don't worry about it. Just do it. You'll figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> that reminds me of, I, I, well, I'm saying how old I am. I don't know how old you are, but when you said that what flashed in my mind was, um, do you remember Karate Kid? Yes. When Mr. Miyagi was making him do the wax on, wax off, and he was so aggravated and he didn't know what the point was, but it was uh -huh. to help him learn. Yeah. 100%. That is right. such a good example because that's exactly what it is. It's like you just go through the practice and you're learning these teachings, but you don't realize you're learning them. And yes. it's only um, you just over time that you realize like, oh, that's right speech. Oh, that's right action. So what I did in the book was kind of try and reverse that, you know, using my own practice. So like, so this is the practice, this is what I learned from it, and this is how it helped me in daily life. So then the hope then is that people can see that and learn from it and get that sort of intellectual understanding right. that we crave so much as Westerners, and then they can use that to sort of fuel their own their own practice. So there are two things from what you shared that I have to, you know, ask you about. And one is that, you know, to say it was an eight month retreat, like what was going on that you decided, I mean, cause eight months, like you would have had to leave your life. Right. Mm -hmm. And I think about how many people, even myself, when I found a practice that really resonated with me, there was that thing of like, almost resenting regular life because you just want to spend all day in practice, right? So can you talk a little bit about what even, like, why? Why would you say, I'm going to walk away from everything and go work <laughs> on a farm and also then tie that into this whole notion of, you know, your suffering followed you. Could you go a little sure. deeper into that? Thanks. Sure, hundred percent. So what was happening at this point is exactly what you just described is that 
I was developing a sort of resentment towards my regular life because like I said, you know, I'd sit and I'd meditate and everything made sense and I understood it. And then I'd go to work or I'd go and hang out with my friends and they just didn't get it. Mm -hmm. You know, it used to be so much fun, Alex. Why don't you want to party anymore? <laughs> that sort of thing. And they're, um, so as Westerners, we tend to like try to segment and cut things into pieces. Right. So, and that's exactly what I had done at this point is I had my spiritual life over here and that was good. And then I had my regular life over here and that was bad. So it really honestly wasn't hard to walk away from my life yeah. because I felt like I needed to make a choice. You know, do I want to walk the, uh, the path of the spiritual or do I want to walk the path of the mundane? So I, I thought what I was doing was choosing the spiritual path and I'm going to walk this path that's good and pure and love and light, et cetera, et cetera, and just leave all of this behind. But, you know, like I said, suffering follows you, right? Yeah. So even on the farm, what I'd realized is that all of the, even though I had moved from a different location, a lot of the same hangups I had in my mind had come with me, right? So if I wanted to really understand the practice, if I really wanted to, you know, overcome my suffering, I had to change my mind, not my, my, not my location. Yes. Right. Um, and we talk about this in Buddhism. It's that, you know, if your mind is, is angry, then it doesn't matter where you are. Even if you go into a beautiful, idyllic forest, you know, you'll find that creek is so loud, I can't sleep. There's too many birds around. They're going to poop on me. Like, you'll find something to be unhappy about, right? right? So having to live in that where, okay, I'm, I'm here for eight months. I don't have anywhere else to go. So I need to figure something out. That really helped me quite a bit, right? Yeah. And then what that did was then expand my mind. So then I started to think about other areas in my life other areas of suffering where, okay, we can't escape this. How can I learn from it? So I tell the story in the book about how I, I got stuck in a traffic jam and I can see the building. Uh, it's a very important meeting. Yes. You know, I, I finally, I'm allowed to stalk directly to our customers and do this presentation. Can I just tell you, I was on the edge of my seat with anxiety, like waiting to see how this unfolded for you as I was reading it. <laughs> oh, just imagine being in the car. Right, with right. Oh. <laughs> but yeah, so I, I'm working at this job. I haven't been there very long, but I finally proven myself. I'm able to do a presentation directly to our customers, okay? And I do everything you're supposed to do to make it go well. I prepare the night well beforehand. I practice in front of my friends, uh, did some dry runs. I set three alarms that day, went to sleep early the night before, did everything right. I wake up that day, I'm driving to work and there's a traffic jam. And it just so happens that where my work is located, there's only one way in and out. So I can't turn around. I have to just sit here and wait for the traffic jam to, to let me pass. And I left early just in case something like this happened. So I'm still, oh, I'm good. I figured this out. I'm ready. But, you know, 10 minutes pass, 20 minutes pass, 30 minutes. We're not moving. And I just see this clock changing in my car going from, okay, I won't be able to do another dry run, but I'll still get there on time, to okay, it'll be closed, but I'll still get there on time, to it just becomes very obvious I'm going to be late. Right. And there's nothing I can do about it, right? So uh, this was early in my practice, but so I, I was freaking out a little bit in the car at this point, but I knew enough from my training that one, what I was doing wasn't helpful, and two, I should do some mindful breathing and just try to like calm down a little bit. So I do that. I call my boss. I explain the situation. I'm apologizing profusely. And then she cuts me off and starts laughing because everyone's caught in this exact same traffic jam. Right. right? So she was actually going to call me to reschedule the meeting. I was just the last person on her list. And when I thought about that exp experience, 
um, when I was on the farm and like, you know, I was meditating and whatnot, I thought back to this experience, I realized that nothing was wrong in that moment. You know, I was in a car, it was air conditioned, no one was doing me any harm. My boss hadn't called me and said, you're fired. Like all my suffering had come from my mind, right? all of it. So that again, just sort of cemented the fact that if one, we can learn about spiritual practice from daily life, because we have all these lessons everywhere to learn from. But two, what we really need to do to overcome suffering isn't to, you know, move to a different place necessarily. It's to just really work on our minds so that we can be happy where we are. Which isn't to say there aren't times where we move or we get a new job, but you know that the joy we get from that is temporary. If we heal our minds, that's that's a lasting happiness. And you even mentioned that in the book, there is a part where you talk about how the difficulty actually gives us an opportunity to practice. Yes. And so, okay, so in your story, I just want to kind of review a bit. So you were suffering in regular life. Yeah. You start these Buddhist practices, you step out of regular life, and then you go and try to connect even deeper to your practice, but you're still in suffering. So yeah. this gives you the insight of like, oh, like wherever you go, there you are. So mm -hmm. exactly. <laughs> I have to get my mind right, so to yes. speak. And so now you're in a space where you understand that like your practice or our practice is how we show up in life and like how we direct the mind, how we manage our mind, how we, just how we are being, how we are living. So our, our regular life and our spiritual life aren't separate from each other. Yes. Right? 100%. Yeah. So in the book, um, you go through not just the, um, the, I forget what they're called now. Uh, the Four Noble Truths. Yes, the Four Noble Truths. And then you go into even how we deal with ending the desire, which causes yeah. our suffering. Mm -hmm. And you talk about the eight, um, sorry, the eightfold path. Yes. All of these words. And, but again, like I say, you use such beautiful examples to simplify it, to really make it hit home. I mean, can you share a little bit about, I don't know if you'll remember, but there was a part where you used the example of rocks mm -hmm. and us carrying these rocks. And yeah. I thought that that would really, really hit home for people. Could you share? A sure. Bit so that? when we talk about suffering, uh, so, so we have to understand that when the Buddha sat under the Bodhi tree and realized enlightenment, uh, when he got up and sh he shared his teachings with the world, he didn't speak in pithy one-liners, right? Mm -hmm. He gave very long, very detailed discourses, which over time have been shortened down to life is suffering, suffering is caused by desire, etc. So we, it's good to look at it on the surface level, but then when we look deeper, we find deeper teachings. So for example, the, uh, the word for suffering that he uses is dukkha which is a word that translates more, most easily to hard to carry or difficult to bear, okay? So if we think of our suffering like a backpack, then our desires are stones that we carry in that backpack, right? And this is why he says suffering is caused by desire. The way to end suffering is to end desire because if you have a heavy backpack full of rocks, the easiest way to make your life easier is to get rid of some of the rocks, mm -hmm. right? So that's part of our practice. That's why his monastics, you know, they lived such restricted lives with one bowl, two robes. They, they slept in huts or under trees because they wanted to eliminate as many rocks in their pack as they could so they could travel lightly on the path and practice. And as lay people, we often think that we can't do that. You know, I, I have a home I need to pay for, I have a mortgage, I have a car, etc. But we can still eliminate some of the rocks, mm -hmm. right? So that's part of the practice is just, you know, practicing right mindfulness, looking at our lives and figuring out what suffering is being caused by desires that I don't need to deal with anymore, that I can just re renounce, give up. What suffering is being caused by desires or rocks that I can reduce? So maybe you don't get rid of the rock, but you crack it in half and you only keep half of it, throw the other half away, right. line your load that way. 
And then uh, what's suffering that we can't escape? We just have to accept and we just have to deal with it and just, okay, this is part of my life, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so one example I like to use for that in terms of suffering we just have to you know, deal with would be washing dishes. <laughs> No, no, no one likes to wash dishes. I've been teaching for a long time. I've yet to meet someone who says, I really love dishwashing. Yeah. But it's something we have to do, mm -hmm. right? So this is a desire we have. I don't want to wash dishes, but we have to. So if we practice acceptance towards that, okay, I have to wash dishes whether I want to or not. Well, now it becomes easier to deal with. Now, instead of fighting ourselves, I'll do it later. It's just all right, this is just something I have to do, yeah. right? Or we can practice uh, reduction, let's say. So maybe this isn't a desire that we can, going back to the rocks, we can't get rid of it completely, but we can crack it in half somehow, right? So we can look at a desire uh, for alcohol, let's say. Now, this is something we could renounce and just, I'm not going to drink at all. But let's say we're not at that place yet. Well, maybe we just reduce our drinking. You know, I, I've met a lot of Buddhists who drink, but they don't get drunk. Mm -hmm. And that's another way that we can reduce the desire and reduce the suffering that's associated with it. So just taking that really grown up view of desire and suffering where we sort of take control of our lives and say, I'm going to accept and deal with the suffering. Mm -hmm. I'm going to examine my desires individually uh, and we have a lot of desires so this is a lifelong practice yes uh, which is fine but we're going to examine our desires and we're going to figure out what to do with each one to create the least amount of suffering as possible to lighten that backpack yeah i love this what you're saying it reminds me of what so many people are dealing with we're all you know dealing with right now is like the quarantine right yes. and a lot of people have been suffering through it like you know for a number of reasons i mean like the laundry list of why but regardless a lot of people are struggling right now with that then you know compound that with you know all that's going on right now in our country with injustice and all of these things so there's like this emotional eruption that's literally happening for so many people now on different levels, right? And I just want to know, I mean, because obviously you're here, living here. Right. <laughs> How does your practice come into play with dealing with, you know, because I, I, I'm sure a lot of us, we can hear this and we go like, okay, I can see how maybe I can use these techniques to support my personal life, my personal day-to-day, -day, whatever, right? But now we're also experiencing on a bigger scale, like collectively there's a lot going on and a lot of people are feeling hopeless, like there's nothing I can do, which adds this element to this feeling of suffering, right? right. So I have to ask you, Sensei Alex, how do you use these Buddhist principles to really support you in like these challenging type of times? Sure. Sure, that's uh, that's a good question, and it's um it, it's a learning. It's a something that we're doing every day. So I always try to explain to students that this practice isn't something that we get, and then we're done and we move on to the next thing. Uh, the Buddha trained for six years before he realized enlightenment under the Bodhi tree, and then after that, he continued training for another forty-five years. And this kind of glossed over in his in the stories, but he endured quite a bit of suffering in that time. You know, his cousin David Dada tried to kill him on several occasions. His homeland was invaded by a rival clan. Uh, his monastics did not always behave like monastics, and he had all kinds of troubles he had to deal with as well. So, this is a living, breathing practice that's meant to deal with real life as it is you know that's why i really tried to get at in the book and this is something i had to learn on my own that you know you don't put on the robes and all of your problems go away right um rather what this practice does is orient us in a way that we can look at our suffering and deal with it in a more skillful way so with this quarantine this is a really good example of that where we have this situation that none of us have control over, none of us asked to deal with this. Um, a lot of our lives are out of our control at this point. 
Mm-hmm. You know, we're told to stay inside. We're told to wear a mask. We have to social distance. And what are we going to do about that? And what's really beautiful about this practice is it gives us what I call, or not what I call, this is what people in the community call an internal locus of control. So an external locus of control is my happiness, my well-being rests on the things outside of me. You know, I'm good if my car is good. I'm good if my job is good. I'm good if I'm not under quarantine, right? But if we move to this internal locus of control, then what ends up happening is it doesn't matter what happens on the outside. I'm okay. And even if I'm not okay, I can bring myself back to center. Mm -hmm. So for me, what this has been is a time to lean very heavily on my spiritual practice, a time to spend a lot of time in meditation, a lot of time in chanting, a lot of time studying sutras, and also a lot of time reflecting and believe it or not, expressing gratitude for this quarantine. So um, we were under curfew recently because we had some we had a protest here and some rioting took place so we weren't allowed to go outside right and that was hard i love going outside (laughs) but what i did in that moment was to reflect on all the days previously when i had been outside and i remembered what a gift that was to be able to go outside Mm -hmm. we don't think of it as a gift. It's just something we take for granted because it's always there. But now that I've had this experience being under quarantine, being under curfew, you know, being stopped by the police as I'm walking down, you know, the sidewalk, we're on court. Don't you know we're on curfew? Why are you out here? Right. Having had that experience as stressful as that was, now I know that outside is a gift. Now I'm grateful for it. Right. Uh, Being able to go to a restaurant. You know, I've been eating my own cooking for about three months now, and I'm not a good cook. (laughs) So just thinking about all those meals I've had with people, you know, and Mm -hmm. how delicious they were and how delicious they will be once all of this is over. And what what ended up happening, this expression of gratitude, this practice of gratitude has oriented me in such a way that instead of quarantine being this terrible, horrible thing, which it is, I don't want to make this like it's not a big deal. It's a huge deal. Mm -hmm. But just like all of our suffering, this can be a lesson for us as well. And we can learn a lot from it. Yeah. I mean, that was beautiful the way that you say it, because it, it really speaks to how instead of just being upset and pushing against like something we can't necessarily change you allowed yourself to have some appreciation which you know it's interesting like listening to you speak it reminds me of how our suffering the things that we resist and you know what it does to the body like what it feels it just Mm -hmm. feels so but when we allow ourselves to have like that clarity of mind that spaciousness how even the body relaxes and we we feel less tense and Overall, it just feels good, right? But what else I have to ask you about, because of what you're saying, I understand in my way because of my practice. And I know that when we talk about the importance of having peace within our own being, regardless of what's going on out there, We have to remember to work on in here and have peace within our own being. And I think that triggers a lot of people in thinking that means like you just don't care or you're avoiding what's out there or you're just like, you know, in your own little bubble, again, not caring about anything and not really realizing how much more impactful and helpful (laughs) you can be (laughs) if you are approaching life and whatever you're going to do from that state of clarity and awareness, right? So can you just speak a little bit to that for people who may feel a bit of tug of war of like, does it mean that I don't care if I'm trying to like work on myself? Sure, sure, absolutely. Because, um, you know, this this is a trap I fell into early in my own practice when I I walked away from everything, you know, forget this, I'll work on a farm. 
Right. So I just need to withdraw, withdraw, withdraw. And actually, this is a bit of a rite of pra practice or rite of passage, rather, in Buddhism. I've talked to a lot of teachers, and we all have very similar stories. Uh, not everyone went to work on a farm, but everyone had their own thing that they did. Maybe they went to India. Uh, maybe they joined the Peace Corps. You know, everyone did something to kind of withdraw from the world, and then they eventually had to come back to it. And this, that is part of the practice. We, we do need to withdraw and just remind ourselves and sometimes just learn for the first time that I can live without these things. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I can live without my favorite restaurants. I can live without being able to go outside. But the next step is to then re-engage with that. And that's where the gratitude comes in. I, I don't need my, these, this restaurant but I'm so grateful that I have it. Mm. You know, I, I don't need, you know, my loved ones, my family and friends. I can survive on my own, but wow, it is so incredible that they're here. And what happens when you approach life from that perspective is you practice something in Buddhism that we call non-attachment. Now, this is different than detachment. We're not saying, go away, I don't need you, but we're saying, we're holding these things with open hands, right? So if you can imagine trying to, uh, I don't know if you've ever seen those sound bowls. Yes. That you strike, right? So if you hold it in your hand and you grip it tightly, there's no sound that comes from it, right? But if you have your fingers open and palms out and it's just resting there, you're still holding it. But because you're not trying to control it, you can get a very beautiful tone. And that's what we're learning in Buddhism. We're learning how to hold things without gripping them tightly. We're learning that non-attachment. Um, another way to think about this would be if you look at a traditional Buddhist altar. So we have Buddha in the middle. And then on his right, we have Kanan, who's the Bodhisattva of Kim compassion. And I talk about her in the book. Uh, she listens to the cries of the world and emanates peace. And we also have a Monju who's the bodhisattva of wisdom, okay? So if you think of the practice, you need both kanon and monju in order for the practice to be whole. It, it, one doesn't work without the other. So usually we, we start off with one or the other based on our personality, but eventually we do have to re-engage. So we, we withdraw, that's the wisdom piece. It's like, okay, I can be okay on my own. I can be self-sustaining. And then the compassion piece, going from Monju back to Kanon, is okay, now I'm going to use this wisdom to enlighten the rest of the world and be part of the rest of the world. Um, and I think Kanon, the Bodhisattva of compassion, is such a beautiful example of this because the way she's usually depicted is riding a dragon in the midst of a tumultuous sea. So she's very peaceful, she's very calm, but she's not on a cloud somewhere far away from everyone. She's right there in the water with us. You know, she's, she's struggling right along with us. But she does that and she's still very calm and very centered because she has that wisdom. Compassion grows from wisdom. Um, we learn this in the Heart Sutra, which says form is no other than emptiness, emptiness is no other than form. So it's important that we remember that we withdraw from the world only so that we can return back to it. That, that is beautiful. Yeah, so, it's, so it sounds like in that, well, there's two things. One, I wonder, because in uh, Reiki, there's um, the Reiki symbols, and the second symbol is connected to Senju Kanan, which is the 10,000 armed Kanan. And it's also yep. the story about the Amida Buddha and the compassion and the tear he cried and Senju Kanan came. So mm -hmm. that reminds me of that, um, what you just shared. But it sounds like, you know, the, the wisdom that we find, like in stepping back, it really creates a solid foundation to give us the strength to re-enter the world, but re-enter the world differently. So that yeah. we like almost like we have to step back to allow ourselves to relearn and re understand, and then coming back into the world with new eyes, so to speak. Mm. 
but you're still part of the world. You're still engaging. You're just going to show up differently. Right, right. We, we, we can't escape the world, right. but we can learn how to live skillfully within it. You know, ah. which is what Kanan does. Um, and this was, this was my own practice. You know, I, I withdrew from the world. I went to the farm. And then I had to leave the farm and come back to the world. And I had to bring these lessons with me. So uh, when we, hmm, and a good example of this is if we look at the historical Buddha and his experience with enlightenment. So he sat under the Bodhi tree. He realized enlightenment. He left and went into Deer Park which is where all the holy people, the religious people hung out in that day in India. And they're trying to figure out what's going on with this guy. You know, he has this beautiful expression on his face. He's very calm. Initially, they thought he was a god. It's like, no, I'm not a god. So then, well, are you a man? No, I'm not a man. So what are you? And the word he uses is tathagata, which is a Sanskrit and a Pali word that means, it has two meanings, he who has come and he who has gone away. So again, we have to leave the world, go away, and then we have to come back to it, right? And that's exactly what he did. He came back to the world through his practice, but he did it with a different view. So he was a man, but he was a man who had transcended, he had a supranatural, not a supernatural, supranatural understanding of existence. So I always um, describe it as someone who's standing on the top of a mountain, and they have that 10,000 foot view of the forest and the valley and they can see everything. But at the same time, they're also down in the valley with everyone else simultaneously on the mountain and in the valley. And now they can use that mountain view to move through the world skillfully and make good decisions and end suffering for them and other people at the same time. I think what highlights for me are saying this is moving through the world skillfully. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's so important, like really considering how we are moving through the world and you know, what our contributions are, what the ramifications are, like not just even to the world out there, but even within our own beings of how we are being right. Mm -hmm. And hearing you say that it's like, Oh, your book is kind of like where the two meet, right? Because you give such clear, understanding of you know what these different again these principles mean but Mm -hmm. you give everyday examples so like we really get it so it's not like okay life is suffering this is ominous what i don't even know what is what is this (laughs) buddhism stuff talking about and then you give these tangible real life expressions that really help us go like oh i get it to help us figure out how we can move through the world more skillfully You know, so, I mean, now thinking about it, it's like, oh, well, this is exactly what you did with the book, Perfectly Ordinary, uh, the title. (laughs) (laughs) Buddhist teachings for everyday life. I mean, gosh, talking about just getting hit in the head with the obvious. So can we, I want to go back to this, like very specifically pointing to the book, because as we mentioned, you talk about the four noble truths and then you go into the eightfold path. So yeah. can you just share for people who aren't familiar maybe with Buddhism, what are the four noble truths and then what does the eightfold path have to do with anything? Yes, absolutely. So I always envision the Buddha having this wonderful spiritual experience under the Bodhi tree and then having trouble trying to explain it to everyone else. <laughs> And then just trying to break it down in ways that made sense for people, right? So um, what he came up with was the Four Noble Truths, which state life is suffering. Suffering is caused by desire. The way to end suffering is to end desire. The way to end desire is the Noble Eightfold Path. So that's sort of the philosophy of the teachings. And then we have the Noble Truth, or the eight, uh, the um, Noble Eightfold Path, which is sort of the praxis or the practical application of that philosophy. So this is really where the rubber hits the road. And there we have um, right view, right intention. These make up the wisdom teachings of the, the path or how we look at the world and how we choose to live in it. We have right speech, right action, right livelihood. These are the morality teachings of the path. And people always, um, 
hem and haw a bit when I say that word morality. But what we have to remember is that morality in Buddhism is not meant to be a kujal that, you know, if you don't do this, you'll be punished. Rather, it's wisdom that's being handed down to us from the Buddha, from other Buddhist teachers that, you know, you're already an enlightened being. This is how you bring that enlightenment into the world through right speech, through th right action, through right livelihood. Now, you're, I assume if anyone's listening to this, they're an adult, so they can make their own decisions, but I've found that these practices have helped me quite a bit, and I talk about them in the book. And then finally, we have the meditative teachings, which is what people usually think of when they think of Buddhism, meditation, and that's broken into right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So I take these teachings and what I do is I give the theological approach. I give the, the technical aspects of what is suffering, what does Buddha mean by desire, what's the Noble Eightfold Path. But then I also give, use examples from my own life to show, okay, well, this is the practical application of each one. Because we have to remember that uh, when Buddha just to tell a quick story, when he was under the Bodhi tree, he was tempted by a demon named Mara, the god of lies, right? So he was, get, he was told that he could conquer the world if he gave up uh, his quest for truth. He said no. He was tempted with sensual pleasures. If he gave up his uh, quest for the truth, he said no. And finally, he was tempted with doubt. Uh, Mara had an army stand up behind him, and he said, this entire army bears witness for me and says, I have the right to be here. Who bears witness for you? And what's beautiful about the story is that Buddha doesn't go into some great philosophical treaty, treaties. He doesn't uh, exhibit any magical powers in that moment. He simply touches the earth. He touches the earth. He touches everyday life. And he says, the earth bears witness for me. And in that moment, there's an earthquake and all the, uh, the army, all the defilements disappear. And then he realizes his own enlightenment. So what I'm trying to do really through this text is just help people touch the earth. You know, help the, allow their own daily practice, their own everyday life to bear witness for them and their own enlightened nature. That is so beautiful. That is so, so beautiful. And I have to say, you know, I meant to tell you this and I'm glad I didn't forget. Your book is exactly what I was looking for um, when I was curious and wanted to understand what Buddhism was and what it was about. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I read some books and I shared with you, I watched a whole series on uh, Netflix. It's like 50 something episodes about the life of the Buddha. I took Buddha Buddhism classes where it was solely focused on meditation, mm -hmm. but I can't tell you, you know, I, it's just how much I just smile. It's like the light bulbs going off from reading your book. I mean, you really do simplify it. And so I think this is great for anyone, not even just necessarily interested in Buddhism itself, but Mm -hmm. wanting to navigate this life more skillfully, as you say. And really, truly, you did a great job with this. So I have to ask you, Sensei Alex, for anyone, first of all, you know, if you want to order the book, Perfectly Ordinary Buddhist Teachings for Everyday Life, where can people get the book? I got mine on Amazon, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, the book is available on Amazon. You can also uh, go to my website. There's a link there. Uh, so it's, you can go to my website, you can go to Goodreads, or you can go to Amazon. Uh, the re website is thesameoldzen.com. URL is just like it sounds, thesameoldzen.com. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and with that, though, as well, I know that on your website, The Same Old Zen, you have um, blogs and you blog a lot. Also, you know, um, kind of like cracking open, going deeper and giving different lenses and angles of all of these teachings, which is a beautiful thing. But how can people work with you? So do you have classes or are people only able to work with you directly in person if they're where you live or? Mm -hmm. So yeah, sure. So if anyone wants to work with me, I do that you know, on an individual basis. And all they would need to do is reach out to me, you know, send me an email and we can set up a Zoom call. 
and we can chat that way. Yeah. I also have a YouTube channel where I post Dharma talks. You can find that on my website, the same old Zen. So there are a lot of ways to reach out to me, but if you want to have a one-to-one -one conversation, you have questions about the practice, you can email me and uh, we'll set something up. Yeah. So the same old Zen.com, of course, the link is down in the show description and you can connect with Sensei Alex quite easily. I'll also make sure to have the um, link to purchase the book down in the show description as well. Mm -hmm. But I have to ask you one last thing before we go, Sensei Alex, if it's okay. Sure. I really want to just ask just simply, like, what has this practice done for your life? Like, <laughs> what, <laughs> what has been the benefit for you and your point of view? Oh, that's, that's interesting. Oh, and at the risk of giving you an answer that stinks of Zen, as we sometimes <laughs> say, um, the benefit really is that it's helped me to stop looking for a benefit. Um, and what I mean by that is this practice allows me to just take life as it is. And I'm really able to enjoy life as it is. And before I started practicing, you know, I was always, you know, looking for an angle, looking for, okay, how is this going to help me get this next whatever I think I need? And now um, the fruit of this practice is I can just be in a moment, whether that's a conversation, whether that's a meal, whether that's a work meeting and just live there in that moment and okay what can i learn from this moment what can i be grateful for in this moment as opposed to constantly having my mind wander somewhere else and being more present allows me to suffer less and also allows me to be a lot helpful for whoever happens to be near me in the moment and yeah, it did reek of Zen, but it was great. <laughs> <laughs> it was absolutely perfect. I thank you so much. So, you know, Sensei Alex, I have to say really, truly, you know, thank you for your work. I'm always so thankful um, for the people who take time to, you know, articulate for us what it is that they've learned and, you know, simplifying for us in their way, because, you know, we all need something different to help the light bulbs go off for us you know and again your book is doing that for me so i appreciate it and i want to thank you for this um thank you for coming on the show to just share with all of us about your work and your practices so i just want to show everyone again the book perfectly ordinary buddhist teachings for everyday life sensei alex thank you so much for coming today oh thank you thank you for having me and for everyone else, thank you for joining us. Be sure to go down in the show description, click on the links, check out Sensei Alex and his book. Bye for now. <laughs>